Here today, four wheel in Australia, we're going to talk about mud. The unthinkable damage that mud causes to your four wheel drive. In this video, I'm going to tell you why you need to think twice about going through mud holes, what it does to your vehicle, the unthinkable damage that I was talking about, and how you can combat the effects. Because sometimes we've got to do it, right? And last but not least, some facts you probably didn't know about mud. <sighs> Let's get to the bottom of it. Mud. Glorious mud. Here are some facts about mud you may not have known. Mud is full of silt, which is not good for your vehicle. Now all these little facts I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to help you make sense of the damage throughout all the different scenarios we're going to talk about. The other thing about mud, it is like liquid sandpaper. If your vehicle is resting up against the mud bank, you are basically sanding the side of your car. It also contains a lot of rocks. So as you're flicking mud everywhere, especially those guys with the wider tires, you are potentially stone chipping your vehicle. The two most unknown facts about mud is the fact that some of it is more salty than the ocean floor, but most mud has some form of salt in it. And not only that, some mud has acid sulfate in it, which means it's corrosive and will actually eat at things. That's the problem with mud. It's so much fun! Worst case scenario, but also the most fun part for driving. Bog holes. More fun when you have to go through them. Like a pig and shit. If you don't have to go through them and you lose your car in here, which is the worst case scenario, it's not a good thing. You'll be kicking yourself forever. Whereas if you had no choice and you had to go through there to get to that campsite, to get to that beautiful location, then it's just part of the, part of the game. It's part of the fun. The worst case scenario, as I mentioned, is you lose your vehicle. You hydro lock your engine. If you get stuck in here, and you're sitting there for a while and there's no action plan in place, water's gonna slowly seep into your car, it's gonna wreck your carpets, then it's gonna move its way into your airbox. If you end up in this situation and your car stalls or turns off, do not turn it on because then you will hydro lock it. It's just not worth it. Get the car out and then check all your fluids, make sure it's all good. Bog holes, puddles, whatever you wanna call them, they be quite deceiving. Like this one here, doesn't look like much, but the neighbouring one can be quite deep. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so it pays to check, hey? The danger is the bit in the middle. I'm standing in a wheel rut right now, and it is literally nuts deep, but just here, I'm up to my knees. On a nice first vehicle, with bash plates and all that stuff underneath it, even with a lift, this is where you get in danger. You need the momentum to get through. Now, if you're on stock tires, you're done. You are going to be stuck right here. You've already walked it, we already discussed that, you checked how deep it is, but if it's quite deep, but you have to go through it, there's something you need to do to prepare yourself. This is a recovery point. You've got to have that in the vehicle before you even cross. What you don't want is someone fumbling around underneath the vehicle when it's too late. We've been in that situation before and that's when things can go wrong. So get your recovery point out first. Install it like you'll see right now. So I'm just getting this kinetic rope ready for Torbs in case you get stuck in a deep section. This is what we did before we crossed the river, which is a very similar procedure to a bog hole. Get the strap out ready, throw it on the back of your vehicle or throw it on the front of your vehicle. If you're going to attach it to the front and someone's on the other side ready to pull you out just in case. Have your recovery ready. Have other people ready and so they know what to actually do as well. That is the best way to avoid water 
inside your vehicle and sinking your vehicle and hydro locking the engine, all those things we spoke about. That is the most important thing. Be ready and you shouldn't get yourself into too much trouble. It's when you're not ready and you're stuck, everyone's running around like headless chooks, panicking, and even worse, the driver is sitting there and he's helpless because he can't get out of the car. He's in the vehicle. Have a plan and you should be right. That's how we prevent the whole situation from the get go. But what if there was no preventative measures in place or it just didn't work out and you drowned your car? Well, that's when insurance comes in handy. So make sure that your insurance company covers water crossings. It's pretty easy to find out. You just ring them up, ask them, do you cover off-road situations? Do you cover river crossings? Most of them who do cover it will cover it in places where you're allowed to be, where you're allowed to cross, where it might be a gazetted road. Once you're outside that area, then it becomes gray and you may not be covered. So just be wary of that. And if you don't have insurance, then oh, I don't know, maybe you should probably think about selling your car. And if you're a buyer, maybe just check if that car was recently posted on Instagram or Facebook, or maybe six months ago, up to the roof and water. It might tell you a couple of things to look out for. Up to you guys. I've got nothing to do with it if you sell your car after you drowned it. I'm just saying. Green death, not the leaves. Green death. This is a real thing that can happen to your vehicle. That is corrosion of copper. Now we may have spoken about this already, but where can green death happen? Anywhere where there's an electrical connection, anywhere where there's copper. So after you've been playing even just in fresh water, it's a good idea just to clean all your electrical contacts inside the engine bay. Now, if you were unlucky enough to be stuck in that bog hole that we spoke about earlier, you may wanna just check all the electrical connections in your footwells, make sure you spray them all with some kind of water displacement spray, get them all cleaned up. Maybe even consider taking it to an auto sparky just to get them to look it over because those wires are so thin, once they start corroding, it's a nightmare. It's a true nightmare. And now, another quick swim while we wait for the next segment. Whoa! Okay. <laughs> There's a good reason to be checking under your hood. <laughs> Someone having too much fun yesterday. Now many of you know that alternators don't like water, right? Well, when it comes to mud and it's silty mud, if you hate mud, your alternator hates mud more than you do. And the problem is it gets in there, it gets in between the contacts and it coats it and it gets baked on there. And the thicker it is, the more siltier it is, and the more times you do it, the worse it gets. On some vehicles, like the 79 series, it hangs right down low. Luckily enough, in the Hilux and many other vehicles, it sits up quite high. But still, if you hit a mud hole too hard, as you can see, it's splashed up onto the rocker cover. It means that it has splashed onto the alternator. So if I keep doing this, I'm gonna end up with problems. Now with the alternator, there is a way you can kind of fix them. Fix another alternator. Stupid o'clock. At stupid o'clock. At beer o'clock. <laughs> beer o'clock, yeah. Pulling out the brush kit and clean the brush kit and flush it with like just fresh clean water. That's all you can really do on the track. So as promised earlier, I was going to show you how to fix these on the track. So what you need, put it back in and off you go. Hopefully that gets you out of trouble. Because on modern day vehicles, if your alternator is cactus, your vehicle's gonna run out of power and once it gets down below 10 volts, your engine's gonna do all kinds of weird stuff because it's not getting the appropriate voltage to everything. And your vehicle's gonna shut down. And then you're a sitting duck until you get towed out. While we're here with the bonnet open, engine parts. What else is a problem in there? All your little pulleys, they're also a problem, like your idler pulley, anything with bearings. The cars started making a bit of a noise after the water crossings. I've had a quick look and it looks like it's the tension of pulley. Your engine is going to be warmed up, it's going to be hot. When that cold water comes in, something hot's going to suck it in. It's going to suck in some air, it's going to suck in the moisture. The bad thing is, when it sucks in the moisture and it's mud, it's got that silt in it. That'll get in there and mix with all the bearing grease and eventually you're going to get this squeaky noise and then after a while you're going to hear something that sounds like it's grinded to a paste. 
and then it's just gonna stop. Silty water in engine bays, if you do frequent through bog holes, you will encounter a problem. And the more you do it, the faster it's gonna happen. Another component that absolutely hates mud and doesn't tolerate it too well are radiators and transmission coolers which are underneath your vehicle. Once they clog up, temperatures go up and it's possible for it to lead to overheating. But overall, your vehicle will just be running hotter and less efficient. With brakes, it's going to be one of your wearable items that you replace. But when you're playing mud, you're gonna be replacing them a lot freaking faster, trust me. I've had to replace mine trackside once. I'd just like you had some spare pads with me. Because that mud gets in there and just grinds away. It gets stuck in, it gets stuck between a rotor. All my brake rotors are pretty much on their last legs, so they've been remachined and that's it. There's no more life in them. So next time they wear down a bit more, I'll need to replace them. And that's much due to just mud, sand, dirt causes premature wear because after four years and only 115 or 120,000 k's now, that wouldn't happen to a normal vehicle. So you'd probably still be in your first brakes if you use your gearing to brake your vehicle with, which I do a lot. So it just goes to show how much your brakes wear. It's actually constantly wearing at it. It's not only when you use the brakes, it's constant because it's all stuck in there. Drums are even worse because the drums, they fill up with all this silty, sandy mud, and all that just grinds away, and your drum brakes are pretty much shot. So I could almost guarantee you, if you spend a couple of days having to go through a lot of thick mud, it's gonna grind away at your pads. The only way to really prevent this from happening is to just not go in mud. So it's not something you can prevent. However, you can fix it. Straight after you've been through a bit of mud and you get the car home, take the wheels off, wash the brakes out. That's the only way. Because if you don't get it all out and you're driving around as a daily driver, going to work and back for the next couple of days, it's going to slowly grind away at it. And if your vehicle sounds like a freight train, which I'm sure many of you have experienced before, that's because there's some mud and there's some rocks stuck inside your brake guard. So every now and then it'll sound like a freight train. It's very noisy. You'll know if you hear it. If you hear that, you need to get those wheels off and clean it out ASAP. Otherwise, you're gonna be up for a few hundred bucks replacing all your brake pads. And worst case scenario, replace your rotors. Your wheels are shaking like hell. They feel like they're gonna fall off. You pull over, you check the wheel nuts, you check the wheels, you check for mud on the outside, you can't see anything. What the hell's wrong with my car? Well, Nine times out of 10, your wheel balance is out because you've been in the mud. And we've had this numerous times on a particular track called the Holland Track on some tagalongs. Uh, we get some people that have never really been off-road before. They have a hell of a time out there, a lot of fun, but on their way home, they're freaking out and rightfully so because they don't know what the hell's wrong with the vehicle. It's shaking like hell. It's mud on the inside of your wheels, on the inside of your rim. The only way to fix that problem is to get a high pressure hose through like that. But even better, take the wheels off. Because some wheels don't have big gaps like this one does, where you can get in and clear all the mud out. That is the only way you're going to be able to sort it out. And even after that, if there's still a bit of mud remaining, your wheel balance is gonna be a lot better, but it may still be out. Driving through a lot of mud, a lot of boggy holes, even if you don't have a choice, or even if you have a choice, doesn't matter, you will throw your wheel balance out by driving through mud. That's just, Part of the fun. Other ways to fix your wheel balance, just to pop that in here. Normally what I do, after I've been through a lot of mud, on your way home, there's generally puddles on the road or puddles roadside or puddles on the track that you're coming out of because all that silty water is pretty good for washing off all the mud, the big chunky mud that's on your wheels. So going through those puddles is gonna help a lot as well. It may even solve the whole problem for you because if you can get to it before it dries, you can pretty much get most of it off. But if it dries, that's when you are not gonna get it off unless you take the wheels off and you clean it like I was stating before. So we lifted the vehicle, not because it looks cool, but because 
I want to show you guys, or better help explain to where mud is an issue underneath your vehicle. So if you get underneath your vehicle next time and you have a look, anywhere where there's a boot, a seal, mechanical components that are moving, uni joints, anywhere where there's a grease point, anywhere where there's some kind of seal, that is where mud can cause an issue if you leave it there. So how long should you take to wash your car? I would say as soon as possible. Once that mud dries, the longer it sits there, the more it's gonna dry internally as well. And as it dries, it actually draws moisture out. So if it's oil or any form of liquid, even grease, it'll draw it out of the seals and leave you with less moisture or less lubrication on all your mechanical parts. And you don't want that because that's when it causes extra wear. When you go to high pressure hose your vehicle as well underneath, just be careful. I would still use high pressure on it, but not so close. Don't go right up to like a CV boot or a uni joint or a grease point and just blast it up close. Don't do that. Blast it from a distance because you are gonna need high pressure to get it off, but not right on it. Because if you blast right on it, you're gonna force that grit, that silt, that, those grains of sand, you're gonna force it into uh, the seals or the bearings or whatever it is you're cleaning. So be very careful. Another thing I'd like to note, if you have rock sliders, like proper rock sliders, they have some pretty big bits that clamp onto your chassis rail, usually like U-clamps. Inside those U-clamps, after years and years of going through mud, mud collects inside there because they're not like perfectly flat because a lot of chassis, they're kind of like a little bit tapered or there's gaps anyway. In those gaps, that salty mud, corrosive mud, is going to sit there and slowly rust away at your chassis rail. I've recently removed my 79 series uh, rock sliders to put new ones on there and we noticed rust. So I've had that repaired. That's from about eight years of driving. So that'll give you a rough indication of when you should start looking. So if you buy a second hand four wheel drive and you know it's been off road, it might be worth pulling those things off and checking them. So wash your car as soon as you can. While we're on chassis rails, we should probably talk about that a, bit, a little bit more. When you go through mud, all these little drain holes in the chassis rail is where all your mud and all that stuff's gonna collect. So when you do wash your car, stick the hose into the chassis rail and just flush it out. Look, there's a whole video on how I recommend you, you wash your full drive. Just go check that out. The link will be at the end of this video. But let's keep moving on because mud does more damage than just that. Prevention and fixing chassis rail from rusting. Well, the fix is obvious. Clean it, sand it back, respray it. You don't want to do that though. So the prevention method is spraying fish oil, uh, this inox free stuff underneath your vehicle. Just cake the bottom of your vehicle. There's also something called strike hole, which is even better, more expensive, but even better. You can coat your vehicle with this stuff, provided it's clean first, then you hit the mud, you hit the beach, whatever you want really, and then you just hose it off. That is the best way to keep your vehicle rust free and clean. And that's probably why my Land Cruiser after eight years is pretty well rust free, except for where I mentioned the, the rock slider where it attaches on a chassis rail where that got a bit rusty. So that's how I keep my vehicles rust free from when I hit the mud. The other way of avoiding it is just avoiding mud altogether, but sometimes you can't. And yet again, another swim. He loves his backstroke. Now you know all the pros and the cons, that's what you gotta take with you next time you go to a bog hole crossing like this or a big muddy section, especially deep bog holes like this. So the pros are, just to recap, loads of fun and when you have to actually go through that, there's no other option, those two pros, I'm calling that a pro, yes, you have to, because that makes it even more fun, you have to conquer the challenge to keep going on your way. It's not often on uh, tracks where you have to go through deep boggy sections. And this is one of those times. Those are two massive pros. The fun and the you have to do it if you want to keep going. The cons. Well, you all know them. We spoke about them. All the negativity about mud. But those two outweigh 
all the cons. But when you don't have to go through the mud hole, all there's left is the fun. So when there is another option, think twice. We have a clear line. We don't have to go through this at all. So those with a lot of experience with mud, you'll probably agree with me here. You would take that way because you don't have to go through that. And I love mud crossings, believe me, but only when I really have to do it because I know the potential damage and long-term rust and effects and not that this can cause that I would choose that way. But if I had to go through it, I'll be one of the first ones to go through it. Think twice. It might be the difference between you guys rocking up the camp in the daylight versus nighttime because you could get stuck here. And if you do end up stuck and you go to camp late, you're gonna need one of these shirts. And that's the end of the video, folks, with a shameless plug for my merch. See you at the merch store. And see you next time.